Hey all, uh, haven't had a bit of content on, well, not for the past few months anyway, um, and I haven't been doing much to the Ranger, you know, as we all are, we're all struggling, finances are tight, so what are you going to do? Remember the last video I put on here, it was like I was planning a massive trip away, and unfortunately, you know, that's not going to be the case anymore. Life got in the way of getting away, if you like, and the money we had put aside to, uh, to sort of spend on a bit of a trip had to be spent on other things. Nothing special, I'm like 98% of the rest of the population, so you know, what are you going to do? Anyway, so I was talking to my son the other day, my youngest son. Uh, you know, I he knows I've got a YouTube channel, and he goes, um, "We were talking about what don't have. I haven't put content on for a while, you know, and it's fairly sort of specific content." And he was like, "Dad, you should try doing like vlog style stuff." So I'm going to give it a go because he uh, he live streams on Twitch, so he plays a lot of first person shooters and stuff like that. One in particular, I can't remember exactly what one he plays, but um, oh, his 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 Twitch channel gets a few views. He actually got. Um, sort of raided by an American last night, which means they like stream his stream and he got a heap of followers. Anyway, so, you know, this was only a few days ago we had this discussion and I thought, well, I'll give it a crack and see and see what we think. Um, you know, if they if they go over well, and also even if they don't go over well, I don't really mind. You know, I'm planning a few of them. I, you know, I've got a few things I'd like to talk about, sort of the army stuff and um, Somalia especially because it's not a very well-known um, operation. Um, in the Australian public's eyes. It's very well known in America, obviously. Um, but yeah, so Somalia and life and other stuff. And Fords, of course, Fords. Um, you know, I, like I was saying before, I'm sure everybody out there is going through the same stuff. Well, funds are tight, you know. Uh, what are you going to do? you just got to keep soldiering on, I guess, you know. So we're going to talk about my favourite subject at the moment. No, that's not Fords, it's me. Um, I thought I'd just throw a quick bit out there, just sort of, you know, about myself. Um, who am I? I am absolutely no one special. <laughs> I'm a 50-year-old guy who lives in a small town in Queensland who drives a 2014 Silver Ranger and is married with two children. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just happen to make some YouTube videos that um, have been helpful to some people. You know, that's about it. I'm absolutely no one special. I grew up in Sydney, uh, you know, in the, specifically in the Sutherland Shire, a suburb called Janelli. Uh, and the Shire is a pretty great place to grow up. You know, even in the 70s and 80s, it was a great place. You know, it was, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was a good place to grow up. Not much crime there, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, I'm an only child, um, so was my mum. Uh, mum was born in Ultimo in 1935. Her house, which is still standing, is uh, opposite Ultimo TAFE, just near Wentworth Park, where the dog track is and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so smack bang pretty much in the middle of CBD, city girl. Uh, her parents, my grandparents, uh, her dad worked on the wharves all his life and obviously her mum was just a housewife like everybody was back then, or all the women were back then I should say, but yeah he worked on the wharves all his life. Um, he didn't uh, serve in World War II, he got pretty close, he got in the line, I can't remember if it was out near uh, Moor Park or something, he got in the line of people like holding their bags, you know, and got to the table and that, what's your name, you know, what's your date of birth, what do you do, and he went, oh, I'm a wharfie, and they went, pfft, no. Nah. See you later, you're going back. So he spent the Second World War turning ships around, loading and unloading ships. Because mum was a bit of a storyteller. And growing up in this, in this sort of Sydney in the 30s and 40s, you know, there's a lot of crime, like sort of the underbelly stuff you see, you know what I mean? There's a lot of crime and, and um, the stuff that my grandfather used to get up to on the wharves is quite funny. Um, I'd love to do a video on some of those stories that she used to tell me about growing up in Sydney in the 30s, 40s. Uh, on my dad's side, I'm a once removed pom. So my dad was born here. His parents were born in England. Um, he was born in Balmain, but he spent most of his early life in Hammondville. So, you know, we're a Sydney family, basically, if you like. Um, he was in the army. Uh, Dad was in the Dad did his national service, and then he left when national service, his two years finished, he joined the army reserve, but back then it was called the Citizens Military Force, so it was called the CMF. Um, his brother was in Vietnam, Uncle Doug, he was in Vietnam. Uh, he was in transport. Dad was in ordnance. He was in ammunition disposal and stuff like that. But quite uh, quite weirdly, my grandfather on my dad's side, so my dad's father, Pom, obviously, uh, he fought in the First World War with the British Army. He was an infantryman, and he fought in the First World War. And he actually fought at Ypres, uh, you know, in Belgium, with the Australians while massive attacks were going on in Ypres. Uh, I think it was either 1916 or 17. Um 
Yeah, and he actually got wounded quite badly. Uh, Eep, it's it's actually pronounced it's actually spelled Y P R E S. It's sort of pronounced Ypres or something like that. It's in Belgium. Massive battles going on in the First World War there, and uh, he actually got quite badly wounded in the shoulder. He got shot up here and collapsed his lung and all that sort of stuff. So he got medically evacuated back to England and then got a got pensioned out of the army. Basically, got a few shillings pension. You know, he was quite significantly wounded. Um, he died in, I didn't really know him, he died in 1955 and he's buried in a cemetery in Newcastle. But when I was doing the research into him, uh, you know, because I'm also used to be, not so much anymore, but I used to be right into like family history and stuff like that. Anyway, so I finds out that my grandfather on my father's side actually spent, because he was in the British Army once again, actually spent 12 months in Malta. And my wife Rosie is Maltese, so that was pretty weird, there's a weird sort of a connection there. Um, yeah, so that was basically mum and dad, you know, uh, for me, nothing special, I'm just, you know, we were just your average Aussie working class family in the 70s and 80s, uh, dad was a sales rep for Alcan for many years, so he was always on the road, it was good being a car guy, because dad used to get a different company car, you know, uh, quite a lot, um, I remember he, he had this, uh, burnt orange Kingswood once, <coughs> Holden, but anyway, never mind. And then he got a, uh, a nice yellow XF Falcon. Oh, I loved that. It was funny because whenever Dad got a new car, um, I used to go and read the manual, read the car manuals, you know, the owner's manual. And I'd say, oh, Dad, this button does this and this switch turns that on. And, you know, he'd, he'd sort of, he knew, but he'd sort of let me do it, you know. And I'd just re- literally read the whole manual from front to back. I'd say, no, no, Dad, you've got to push that to do this, you know. And he kind of sort of make deliberate mistakes and stuff. So, you know, I could correct him and all that. It was pretty cool. Dad and I got on really well. We're like uh, we're like thick as thieves, um, but yeah, uh, where are we? Um, so yeah, nothing special. You know, once again, nothing special. I had a pretty good education. I went to private school, public and high school, Catholic college. We're mildly religious Catholic family. You know, standard sort of said once again, standard seventies, eighties Aussie family. Because Mum was just a housewife, like everybody. You know, most women were in the seventies, eighties. You know. Um, uh, I don't know, if, can we call them that, homemakers? I think we have to call them now, I don't know. Um, one of my big memories is just her forever peeling beans at the kitchen table. I don't know why. It doesn't seem like we had beans a lot often. It's just one of those memories that sticks in your head, you know, at the kitchen table peeling be- beans with this bean peeler that was like a grandmother's or something like that. So, you know, grows up, goes to school, gets out at the end of year 10, like most of us did, like I'm 50 at the moment. You know, I'm 50 at the moment. Of course I'm 50 at the moment. Um, you know, back then, you never really went on to year 11 and 12 unless you were going to be like, uh, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, something, something that required a university degree. Um, and there's no earn or learn. It was just finished year 10 and see you later. You know, there was that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, growing up, all I ever wanted to do was join up. All I ever wanted to be was in the army. That was that was it. It was uh, my sole intention. It didn't help having you know my dad and my uncle talking. My, my uncle talking about Vietnam, and then my dad used to put me to bed at night with stories about like the antics they used to get up to. You know when he was when he was in and, and weapons and drill and you know he used to teach me like drill movements and all that sort of stuff. Just mucking around, you know. So I probably didn't have much of a choice, but I always wanted to join up. Never wanted to be a policeman, fireman, or ambulance or anything like that. Um, or a pilot, uh, not that I was smart enough to be anything like that, so uh, good old good old grunts took me. So yeah, so I um, had a couple of jobs, uh, nothing, <laughs> I could have stopped saying nothing special. Uh, first job out of school was a place called Deville Industries at uh, Kirui. They're a uh, sheet metal factory, and this is interesting, they used to make lockers and ovens. So they'd make lockers that you put your clothes in, you know, like a work site or your school lockers and stuff like that. And, uh, and then they also made ovens, domestic ovens. That <laughs> was really odd. Did a few interesting deliveries, delivering lockers out. Um, one of the big ones that I remember is um, the police station. I think it's, I don't know if it's, it was near Oxford Street is where I can sort of remember it being built in the 80s. And we delivered like three, 400 lockers out there. We had to do it over a few days. And it was pretty cool, you know, carrying lockers through. It was almost completed then. And you were carrying lockers through and you're like passing the rifle, the pistol range and stuff like that, the indoor pistol range, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, so, like I said, uh, sorry, no, then after Deville, I worked at, um, this is going to date me, I worked at uh, Grace Brothers at Miranda Fair, a big shopping centre in the Shire, uh, and I was a stock hand, so the guys on the dock would unload the trucks, and we'd come around with these little custom-made narrow pallets to fit through the hallways, and we'd have our pallet jacks, and we'd take the stock from where they were on the dock out onto the sales floor and things like that, and unpack it, set it up, and then on little storerooms out on the sales floor, put it in like a little storeroom, you know, for the stock 
Yeah, that was a great job. It was it was actually a pretty good job, actually, because we were like, you know, the great unwashed. You know, we'd come out from behind, you know, <laughs> and so everybody else is all nice and customer service. They're really out the front, and then we come out in a stinky T-shirt and <laughs> dropping all the stock off, you know. Um, so that's I'd been out of school probably about a year, and uh, yeah, because I left school at 16, and you obviously have to be uh, 17 to join up. So basically on my 17th birthday, I filled out the enlistment papers. And lo and behold, next thing you know, I'm in the army. Now, I'm planning a separate video on army life and specifically what it was like to be in the army in the great peace, you know, which is like from the end of Vietnam. Not that I was there, obviously, in Vietnam. I joined on the 10th of June, 87. But, you know, that period where nothing was happening, where, you know, guys were, going, were being in the army for 20 plus years and leaving with a long service medal. We just weren't going anywhere. And not a lot of money was being spent on the army either. Um, yeah, so, you know, so I ended up in the army. Great. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Bit of a naive 17-year-old, you know. Um, so, yeah, married, uh, was in the army, been married twice. I uh, married a local girl first time up there in Townsville. Uh, we were obviously too young, but we had two great kids. Um, unfortunately, you know, once again, life gets in the way and our, uh, uh, you know, marriage didn't end well. We, we had a, got a divorce and then I, that end of that year, I actually got posted to Sydney and that was sort of leading up to that's where I met Roseanne, my current wife, um, and we're obviously still married. And she had two stepsons from her previous marriage, Andrew, who's 28, and uh, Jason, who's 26. But I've been in their lives since they were four and two, you know. Um, they're both in IT, pretty much because of me. I, put, I love computers and all that sort of stuff, so I put them in front of computers when they were very young. Um, Andrew's just finished up like a... Um, it, it's like a bachelor's degree in... Uh, uh, information technology so he's like a computer programmer he programs games um, yeah he's either programming them or playing them <laughs> or you know creating them or playing them and my younger son is an IT manager for a company in Ipswich and he, they're both doing fine which is really good which is a really good thing why don't I start the channel well, I've pretty much always been into Fords. Uh, my dad loved them, and uh, he had a lot of company cars, like I was saying before. He had a couple of Holdens, but um, mostly Fords. Uh, he had a really nice XB. I was about 12 or 13. He had a beautiful um, sort of midnight blue XB, and he would have been like in his, probably in his 50s by then, had big go-fast stripes up the side and a radar detector in it and stuff like that. And I was in love with that car. I got a photo of it somewhere. I'd have to show you. Um, Show you a photo of it. So personally, myself, talking about Fords, um, you know, I owned most of them. <laughs> I had an EF Fairmont. Um, I've owned a, a AU first generation XR6. Didn't have the HP engine, it just had the VCT, six cylinder. Uh, I had a really nice AU Series 2 XR8 that I was in love with, uh, the hand built 220 kilowatt engine. Um, love that thing, it was red. I love the quad headlights on the front of them, I think the front looks really sexy. Um, then after that, uh, NL Fairlane. <laughs> there was only a six though, it wasn't the V8. Um, NL Fairlane, my youngest son, Jason, that I was talking about earlier, he actually learnt to drive in that, which actually wasn't bad because, um, you know, it was a big car, so, you know, he got used to driving a large car, not a tiny little hatchback sort of thing. Uh, XT Falcon and two Rangers. So to say I enjoy Fords and like them, uh, it's a little bit of an understatement. So anyway, so being cashed up, um, you know, uh, after we moved out of Sydney, we moved up to Scone. Um, so I was cashed up. So at the time, for my sins, believe it or not, I was actually driving a Triton, silver Triton. You know, to be honest, that Triton wasn't bad. It was an MN, I think, MN Triton, 2014. I didn't mind it. It was really super economical. But um, the biggest problem I had was the... Because I'm not a little bloke, as you know from my videos, I'm, I'm on the larger side... Um, Chairs after all the seats were like concrete on your ass after a while. Uh, even my wife, who's you know obviously not a large girl, um, uh, had trouble. We had to go and get those um, those cushions you can buy them from Office Works. You know they got the cutout for your coccyx. I'm pronouncing that deliberately. Your coccyx bone, you know your tailbone. It's got like a little cutout. You sit them on like hard office chairs and stuff. We had to buy one of those each because even after just a couple of hours, it was like you'd been sitting on a lump of concrete. It was pretty. Um, Pretty ordinary. Anyway, so um, yeah, traded that in on a, on a brand new 2016 uh, Mark II, PX Mark II Ranger, and loved it. A beautiful blue colour. Well, you've seen it in the videos anyway, you know, and that kind of sort of started me on the road of, um, 
you know, because you have a ute and, you know, you see guys going around with lights and snorkel and UHF and bull bar, maybe a lift, nice tyres, good wheel, or, you know, nice wheels, good tyres. And you start thinking to yourself, mm, you know, I wouldn't mind a bit of that for mine. And then you start looking into, like, how much this is going to cost to get this installed and so on. And you think to yourself, mm, I wouldn't mind having a crack at that myself. And uh, sort of, that's kind of sort of what led me to do it. Um, you know, I'd had it for about a month or two, and you know, as I said, you want to do like small mods and things like that. So I started, went onto the internet and I started to find some stuff. Um, now look, I couldn't find many videos, especially on the new style of the Ranger. Um, you know, the new body shape. Not even many on the older ones, the um, PJs. Uh, yeah, so I was like, oh, I might be able to like, just show how you can do things you know that was my thought process i didn't put any kind of you know oh i'd like to make a youtube channel i want this many subscribers and this many views and all that sort of stuff not at all you know um so like i was saying i found really really good forums one that springs immediately to mind is newranger.net great forum heaps of information guys have done a million things over it in the past the only problem i found with that is it's just like well i have a little bit of a script here so i'm sort of so i can keep my place and it's basically reading what's that what they did and that's fine you can sort of put it in your mind you know probably 70 percent of the posts had photos attached but as the time started to go on you know if these guys didn't keep like their photo bucket uh account open or it lapsed or they deleted a video uh, uh image you just have the you know the photo bucket can't show you this image obviously you had to register for the forum before you could look at images and stuff like that so there were some great posts where there were photos um, but it's still, still for me, you know, and I'm not the smartest tool in the, in the shed, or the sharpest tool in the shed, I should say. Um, for me, it seemed not difficult, but but hard to imagine it and then transfer it onto the car, if you like. So you know, you read a post and it says, yes, you go through here and you take this out and you put put poke your cable through there, and then there's a photo of it. But there's a photo of the cable already going through, you know. So it's sort of like the job's already done. So um, I basically decided to create the channel with videos um, so I can describe them and you can see them happening. I know admittedly most of mine are sort of after the install process is done, but I think I get fairly descriptive, you know, and I, and I sort of point and say this is where I went through and I went up here and round this corner and, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, mainly also I wanted to, um, to show that someone who really has absolutely no knowledge of um, auto electrics or anything like that uh, and is shocking on the tools, uh, yeah, shocking on the tools, uh, can have a crack, you know, can have a go. Um, I wouldn't call them super basic things because you sort of like got to tap into wires and things like that and you're dealing with, you know, cable runs and, you know, your battery and fuses and things like that. So it would probably just, for me to look at it, it would be like one step above sort of basic stuff. Oh, I'm just going to have a sip of me brew. Oh, this is the closest I'll get to a Mustang, by the way. Drinking a one, drinking out of a cup with one on. Oh yeah, latte. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought I'll create this video and just see what happens. Uh, funnily enough, my dual battery install video on the Blue Ranger is like over thirty thousand views. Over thirty thousand views, and there's a few there that are like, you know, eighteen hundred, two thousand, two and a half thousand. So I'm happy that, you know, people are actually getting. Uh, I've got to stop knocking the bloody mic stand. I get, uh, I'm happy that people are getting the use out of it, you know. Anyway, so uh, so that was it. I only created the channel, loved Fords, had my Ranger, wanted to do stuff to it, didn't want to pay a fortune for it, you know, get some Sparky or, you know, take it to Ford and get it done sort of thing. Um, and couldn't, and had trouble following forum posts with just photos. So I had a quick look around and, and yeah, there wasn't much content on the new style Ranger. So I thought, okay, this could be something I could do to, you know, um, maybe help a bloke out there who's, who's thinking of the same thing. And to be honest, you guys that have subscribed and a lot of people that have commented, you know, are saying, oh, yeah, I got this, or it might even be for a different vehicle, but things like the kick-ass battery box set up and things like that. They're like, oh, yeah, I got that. And can you tell me, did you install this? Did you connect this wire? And then you can see later on with my Silver Ranger, I did like a, a sort of a more in-depth look at it and just basically said, no, nah, this is how it came from the factory. This is what they said to do in the instructions, and this is what I did. It's just this is how I ran my cables and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like it's funny because a lot of because I was in the army, a lot of people say, um, 
oh, don't you know how to do like weld and, you know, do all this tooly stuff? I'm like, nah, <laughs> we were infantry. <laughs> Our job wasn't to, to, to build things, it was to blow shit up. Well, pioneers, shout out to, quick shout out to Doc Pepper there. Uh, pioneers um, blow shit up. Doc Pepper's a mate of mine who stumbled across uh, my videos. Um, we were in the battalion up in Townsville together in the 80s. And uh, yeah, he was a pioneer. And uh, they're sort of an infantry battalion has its own support. So it has pioneer signals, mortars, snipers, reconnaissance platoon, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, um, no, our job was to protect the guys that did that. So we had, like, engineers, pioneers, not so much. They protected themselves, pretty much. But, um, like, if something broke, like a vehicle, well, the, the recce mech would come forward, the recovery manic mechanic would come forward in his vehicle. And our job was to protect him while he recovered that vehicle, took it back to be fixed or whatever. So 20 years, nearly 20 years in the infantry, no real tool skill. I've gotten better as time has gone on, just by repetition, and just making a lot of a lot and a lot of mistakes, making a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, I'm going to run through. So I'll do some other videos and stuff on some of the mistakes that I've made. Well, you've already seen with the trailers and that, but also, um, you know, just mistakes. Uh, you know, I was five mil out here. This was too short. This was a bit long. Had to add a shim. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so that's basically it. You know, that's a bit about me um wonderful yeah very interesting i know um why i started the channel and why i started the channel um i've got a bit of um diy kind of stuff i'm going to throw on like i said earlier you know i'd like to throw a few more about army life and you know like i said start somalia it's pretty important to me but um yeah that's it um i really want to thank everyone for subscribing uh you know this is a completely amateur channel i don't have any kind of sponsorship or bloody uh you know, product placement or anything like that. Everything you see, I bought with my own funds or or afterpay, because um, my credit rating. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> uh, afterpay or OpenPay or uh, Zip or uh, Hum. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, look, I try to respond as quickly as I can to comments. Um, you know, I really appreciate your views. I know I say this all the time, but I really appreciate people viewing them. And I really appreciate the fact that people comment and say that it helped them. That's that, that was my that's my sole intention, is to make videos that, uh, that that people can see and say, oh yeah, I can have a go at that. You know, just average schmo. You know what I mean? No, you don't need to be Mr. Flame and Snap on Tools representative of the year. You know, to be like a have a go. You know. Um, so I've been trying trying to think up a cool tagline so I can end these videos because you know all the cool YouTubers have a tagline or something. <laughs> And Doc Pepper will uh, sympathise with me on this. The only thing I can think of is our old regimental motto. <laughs> so we'll end it. We'll end it like this. So um, our old regimental motto. So uh, thank you for watching, and remember as always, duty first. Cheers all. Bye.